Hello, and welcome to this lecture, Culture of the Cotton Kingdom, Antebellum, Alabama, 1830 to 1860. The dates are a reminder that, as one of my former professors once said, the Old South ain't that old. We'll cover these topics, cotton production, enslavement of black labor, and antebellum culture, especially education, publishing, and religion. This lecture does not cover everything you should know about this subject and era. It's my gloss on your text, Alabama, the History of a Deep South State, and sometimes summarizes other sources to provide something a bit different than does that textbook. Let's begin with cotton and its production. In the original English settlements, different colonies produced different raw materials for the English market, controlled from the so-called metropole of London. Pennsylvania and other middle colonies produced wheat. Virginia and North Carolina produced tobacco. North Carolina also produced naval stores. South Carolina produced rice, and both South Carolina and Georgia produced cotton but not just any cotton and not in vast quantities. What they produced along the coast was Sea Island cotton with a long, loose staple, that is the fiber bowl, and the fibers were about 1.2 inches long, and slick black seeds. Because cotton was deseeded by hand for so long, this was the fastest cotton to deseed, but it was still painfully slow. Away from the coast, farmers planted small amounts of what's called green or upland cotton. Green cotton had a shorter staple. The fibers were slightly less than an inch long, so they required better spinning technology to make into thread than long staple cotton. Even more problematic, its seeds were sticky and fuzzy, so they were extremely difficult to remove by hand. That changed after 1793, when Eli Whitney produced a working prototype of a cotton gin, a machine that used a cylinder studded with pins that pulled the cotton bowls through metal combs, thus separating the fiber from the seeds. Even when operated by hand, this cotton gin immediately raised cotton lint production by uh, 10 times for each person. Many gin makers got into the act, most of them by stealing Whitney's idea and fiddling with it. For his part, Eli Whitney spent most of the two decades after 1793 in patent court, but he also got a contract to produce guns with interchangeable parts for the U.S. Army. This was at a time when most guns were made by individual gunsmiths, not assembled from interchangeable parts. The big innovation in gin technology was using saws rather than a nail-studded cylinder and gearing them to use water or mule power rather than being turned by hand. Cotton gin makers, the most important of which in Antebellum, Alabama, was Daniel Pratt of Prattville, moved west with new cotton lands. Let me give you the example of Pratt himself. He moved from New Hampshire to Milledgeville, Georgia in 1819, where he built some of the still standing mansions when it was the uh, Georgia state capital. Then he moved to Clinton, Georgia, where he learned to build cotton gins under Samuel Griswold. When creek removal made travel to central Alabama a little bit easier, Pratt relocated to eventually Autauga County, where he built a gin manufacturing facility a cotton textile mill, and the private town of Prattville. That is, he went west as new cotton lands opened up to build gins. Then as even more western lands opened to cotton production, he sent salesmen into these new lands. Alabama's Black Belt is a perfect place to grow upland cotton. It has a long, hot growing season, sufficient rainfall, and the soil is a deep strata of rich black humus atop limestone chalk. Slavery, cotton gins, and accelerated demand for cotton by British mills led to Alabama becoming the cotton kingdom. In 1830, the census kept no record of the amount of cotton produced, but in 1840, according to Thomas Owen, 
in his 1921 History of Alabama and Dictionary of Alabama Biography, Alabama produced a little over 234,000 bales. That almost doubled over the next decade, and in 1850, we produced almost 452,000 bales, and there were over 16,000 plantations that produced more than five bales each. In 1860, on the eve of the Civil War, we produced 792,000 bales. This vast production made the planters of Alabama and of the South in general the richest group of people in the United States. But that wealth was generated on the back of enslaved labor. Economic historian Gavin Wright, in his 1986 book, Old South, New South, maintains that Old South plantation owners were not really landlords that is affixed to the land like we imagine from all the sentimental tales like Gone with the Wind, but were in fact labor lords whose primary resource was enslaved labor, not land. As intensive cotton cultivation wore out the land, these planters moved themselves or maybe they just moved their labor force to new lands with little regard for attachment but in search of higher returns on investment. As Wright wrote on page 17, quote, slaves were movable. The other forms of investment were not. Even for a slave and slave owner who spent a lifetime in one locality, potential movability determined the value of those enslaved people. The French under Bainville introduced African slavery into Alabama in 1721, which I covered a little bit in the previous lecture. In 1808, the importation of Africans and other area slaves like Caribbean slaves was banned under the U.S. Constitution, though we know that Tim Mayer's ship, the Clotilda, arrived in Mobile Bay in 1860 with a cargo of over 110 Africans that he had enslaved on a bet. As an aside, Mobile journalist Ben Raines, working with others, discovered the burned and slunk sunken Clotilda near 12 Mile Island in Mobile River in 2022. Okay, nevertheless, after 1808, most of the enslaved came to Alabama with their enslavers to work plantations or through what was called natural increase, meaning the birth of children. Laws existed to prohibit importation of the enslaved from other places unless they came with their enslavers to work on plantations. Now, I suspect this law was not followed well, and there, were a, there was a good deal of leakage in its application. The intent of the law was to prohibit a thriving slave trade, or maybe it was to prohibit a trade in slaves that benefited merchants rather than slave owners. Squaring this law with what we know about slave markets in Alabama is difficult. But an obvious workaround is that owners bought slaves claiming they were going to work on their plantation and then resold those slaves either after working them a little bit or even before getting them to the plantation. I'm unsure exactly how to square these contradictions, and I propose this idea only as a hypothesis. Slavery could not exist as widely as it did without legal sanction. This means the law eventually had to define the param parameters of enslavement. And in Alabama, the law did just that. In 1724, Francis Code Noir was imposed by the Bienville government on, on uh, Alabama's French colony. But more important to our study are the Alabama Codes of 1833 and 1852, which drew those parameters, defining what it meant to be enslaved or even to be a free person, person of color. Let's talk for a second about what a code of laws is. A code of laws is an occasional compilation of the laws that were passed by the legislature in its various sessions and that are in effect at the time of the making of the compilation. 
the legislature authorizes a compilation, usually by a committee of legislators, judges, and lawyers, and pays for it to be printed. That is, they pass a specific act to allow the compilation. What these codes did of 1833 and 52 was to create legal disabilities for enslaved people. The assumption always was that the enslaved were lifelong servant properties and that their offspring would be the same. The 1833 code had distinct sections saying that the enslaved could not bear witness in trials, could not carry arms, get this, without written permission from a justice of the peace and then only on the enslaver's property, could not gather in groups of five or more, could not trade, could not be away from home, could not go at large, and could not hire themselves out without permission. They could not be taught to read or write, which also applied to free persons of color, could not keep company with free people of color, and if they were preachers, had to be licensed by a recognized denomination, quote, in the immediate neighborhood, unquote, and then they could preach only in the presence of five enslavers. In 1833, emancipation was possible, but was very limited. The 1852 code was more legalistic, better laid out, and spread the array of laws about enslavement across three chapters of its Title 13. These chapters did not only apply limitations on the agency of the enslaved, but imposed responsibilities for keeping the system in place on whites and on free people of color. It raised the barriers to socialization, I'm sorry, it raised the barriers to social participation of free people of color too, in ways that not just discouraged and disempowered them, but also turned them into virtual slaves. Chapter three empowered white patrols. These were composed of slaveholders under 60 and all other whites between 18 and 30, 45. They were liable for duty for two weeks per year, during which time they were to patrol in groups in their precinct at night, and their job was to catch the enslaved who were either out of place without passes or were runaways. Chapter four on the disability of the enslaved left all of the disabilities of the 1833 code intact, but they were more organized and emancipation was not legal, no longer legal after 1852. Chapter 5 imposed new restrictions on free people of color. In addition to the older restrictions from 1833, like the inability to write passes for enslaved people, by 1852 they could not trade with slaves. That is, not only could slaves not trade with them, but there was a legal issue if they traded with slaves could not visit the enslaved on plantations, which interfered with couples, nor could they meet with five or more male slaves. In addition, free people of color could not sell liquor, either on their own or as a clerk or an agent for someone else. And the restrictions that had applied to slave preachers in 1833 were extended to free people of color. If they wanted to preach, they had to be licensed by a recognizable, excuse me, by a recognized denomination in the immediate neighborhood, quote unquote, and could only preach in the presence of five or more enslavers. As much of their effort was extended, keeping the enslaved under their thumbs and being swallowed up by the pursuit of land, slaves, and cotton, that is, money and the things it bought, White society in Alabama developed cultural institutions. In the antebellum era, these were frontier cultural institutions, usually starved for money and impeded by low densities of population. In this last portion of the lecture, we'll look at the patriarchal nature of, Alabama, of Alabama's, pardon me, antebellum society. We'll also look at schooling, publishing, and religion. Again, this does not replace your readings, but it is my gloss on those readings leavened with my own studies and observations.
One thing that's obvious but is not analyzed in your textbook is the position of the patriarch of the family and how all pervasive that power arrangement was. Professor Stephanie McCurry's 1995 book, Masters of Small Worlds, lays this out for Antebellum, South Carolina. And although she called for similar studies for other states, few people have taken her up on this, partly because she said so much that appears to be so broadly applicable. She notes, and I believe we can hypothesize that we'll see the same thing in Alabama, that law and custom place the home and the homestead, that is the land, under the complete control of the man, the patriarch. The enslaved as well as unenslaved women and children were equally under the patriarch's control. That is, they had no rights outside of those the patriarch allowed them and that were supported in the law. That is, the patriarch could not give them rights that the law did not also recognize. Thus, our textbook goes over this. Education for women either did not exist, yeoman family saw little advantage in education, or it was to make upper class women into suitable companions, mothers, and controllers of household servants. This is not at all unique to the South or to Alabama, but it did pertain in the state of Alabama. Alabama had many locally operated public schools of varying sizes, mostly tiny and very few beyond the first few years. So it's difficult to compare numbers then with numbers of schools today. As reported by the Encyclopedia of Alabama, in 1850, Alabama had over 1,100 public schools, and a decade later, it had over 1,900. The reason for this increase is most likely the Public School Act of 1854. But first, let's talk about school funding. Public schools were funded by local taxes, direct contributions, that means gifts, and 16th section funds. Remember we discussed how Governor Isaac Pickens had persuaded the legislature, because there was no school board, department of education, or superintendent of education then, to put the state's 16th section funds into the Bank of Alabama rather than use it to directly build schools. Then in 1843, the state bank failed and lost most of those funds. By 1854, the state's 16th section funds had been built back up. So, influenced by educational reformer Horace Mann and based on experience with Barton Academy in Mobile, the Alabama legislature passed the Public School Act of 1854 that did two important things. It appropriated state funds to building and supporting schools though it was a pittance, only $100,000, and it created the position of superintendent of schools. Because it was subject to the political whims of the legislature, that small appropriations failed after 1856, which is one of the reasons Alabama's budget has 86% of its funds earmarked, specifically designated to specific things, so the legislature can't not do those things. What happened in the few years before the Civil War was that local areas resume, uh, resumed supporting schools as they had earlier with local taxes and local money, but all of this diminished funding. Such funding was also misdistributed. Some wealthy areas had good schools while most of the state had poor schools. What filled in in many places for public schools was private schools, often called academies. They charged tuition and, like public schools, had no real set standards. And sometimes education theory could be pretty whack. Usually they were under the direction of self-styled professors, many of whom had actual experience teaching in other places or teaching in colleges, so they weren't all charlatans. Some of them were. Sometimes these professors made enough money from tuition but often they were supported by a benefactor. Let's use uh, the case of Prattville again. Daniel Pratt and some other wealthy citizens of, of the town subvented 
Prattville Academy by providing building materials for a well-appointed school and money for, to support the teacher beyond what tuition could supply. By 1860, our textbook reports that 206 academies existed in Alabama, and the Encyclopedia of Alabama reports that 250 academies existed by 1860. Now, many of these were high schools, or they were the equivalent of our modern eighth grade and ninth grade. Sometimes a public school existed for elementary schools, and an academy took over from there. Where neither public schools nor academies existed, Plantation owners brought in itinerant tutors. We have a good example of one such tutor in Philip Henry Goss, a British naturalist who was also an opponent of Darwin. He invented the aquarium and he was a tutor in 1838. He was 28 years old at the time. He was a tutor in Alabama for the children of Alabama Supreme Court Justice Reuben Saffold in Dallas County. Goss himself only had about seven years of formal education, and he stayed with Saffold only eight months. He did publish a book, Letters from Alabama, in 1859, with copious illustrations of bugs that he had drawn from life by looking at them through, now get this, a microscope he had made with two lenses and the thigh bone of a chicken. In addition to public schools and academies, the infrastructure of education in Antebellum, Alabama depended on one public university and multiple private, usually denominational colleges. I've lined up chronologically all of the privates and I've added the one public university at the end on this slide. All of these are, of course, white schools. Tennessee Methodist founded Athens Female Academy in 1822 as a four-room school for women in the Tennessee Valley. It is now Athens State University. In 1830, at opposite ends of the state, the Jesuits founded Spring Hill College in Mobile and Methodists founded LaGrange College near Florence. Spring Hill College still exists and LaGrange is the ancestor of the University of North Alabama. In West Alabama in 1836, Presbyterians founded the Livingston Female Academy, now the University of West Alabama, and it was long under the tutelage of Julia Tutwiler. Two years later, the Baptists got into the act in Marion by founding Judson College as a school for women. It recently closed, um, like in 2022. In 1842, they founded Howard College in Marion, and that's linked with Marion Military Academy. Marion Military is a community college now, and Howard moved to Birmingham to become Samford University. In 1854, Methodists also founded the Alabama Conference Female College in Montgomery, which is now Huntington College. And then two years later in 1856, these same Methodists wanted to found a male college. So they examined competing proposals from Greensboro over in Hale County and from Auburn in what is now Lee County. Greensboro won, so Methodists founded Southern College there. But the Auburn people were undeterred. So they founded on their own East Alabama Male College, and then they bullied the Methodist Conference into accepting it. Southern became Birmingham Southern later on, and East Alabama Male College became Auburn University. Alabama's only antebellum public university was allowed by the Constitution of 1819, proposed in the legislature in 1820, and finally founded with four buildings in 1831, that is, the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. This was, to a great extent, a finishing school for the elite young men of the Black Belt. But stories of that first few years, which are ably told in Alabama, the history of a deep South state, demonstrates just how much of a frontier society Alabama actually was. Education for two of the four great professions, in this case medicine and law, the other two are college professors and ministry, was haphazard at best. Physicians usually served apprentices in the old craft system, working with a doctor to learn what that doctor knew, then striking out on their own. 
1852, after a planned medical college in Wetumpka failed to open in 1845, physician Philip Shepard founded Graffenberg Medical Institute in Dadeville. Shepard himself had served an 18-month apprenticeship in Georgia, then studied at Augusta Medical College. About 50 doctors graduated from this four-professor school between its opening in 1852 and its closure in 1861. In 1857, Mobile physician Josiah Knott, who argued for the so-called separate genesis thesis to describe racial distinctions, and who also figures prominently in Stephen J. Gould's book, The Mismeasure of Man, for measuring intelligence via cranial, cap cranial capacity by taking skulls from dead white people and dead black people and filling them with mustard seeds. Well, Josiah Knott and other Mobile-based members of the Medical Association of the State of Alabama founded the Medical School of Mobile that eventually became the University of Alabama at Birmingham. The Medical Association of the State of Alabama was founded in 1847. It went bankrupt in 1855 was not really much of anything until 1868 when it was revived, but it was only in 1877 that Alabama allowed the Medical Society to set standards of practice and to conduct licensing exams. Now, the legal profession wasn't much better. Early Alabama lawyers immigrated into the state with educations from elsewhere. Some of them set themselves up as part-time teachers and they oversaw apprentices. By 1821, the legislature um, acted saying that to get a law license, a candidate who had read the law only had to stand for an exam under two district judges, usually trial judges, and it was their professional judgment whether the applicant passed or not, whether the applicant knew enough law to participate. The state tried to create a law school at the University of Alabama in 1845, but officials used contradictory school rules and regulations to sabotage it. The Code of 1852 fostered legal knowledge standards, but reduced the number of required examiners to a single trial judge. It also established only five places in the state where applicants could take examinations. Then in 1859, lawyer Wade Keyes established the Montgomery Law School but unfortunately it closed with the Civil War after graduating a single class. Let's move on to publishing. Publishing was how information and ideas spread beyond a local area. So let's look at it as part of Alabama's antebellum culture. Now, note, however, that we've talked about how much antebellum Alabama was a frontier culture. Publishing suffered from one of the most important aspects of that frontier culture, the rejection of literacy. Today, we tend to believe that literacy is the mark of intelligence, but literacy is late to the human experience, especially widespread literacy. Most cultures are based on orality, especially if they are highly localized. This was true of Alabama, where literacy was not unusually low for the United States, but it simply wasn't prized as we prize it today. Literacy, at least early on, wasn't an absolute necessity for frontier life, especially if someone did not participate in the market economy. Even when it was needed, rudimentary literacy usually sufficed. Being highly literate, that is, behaving within the bounds of the literate culture, prizing the written word, committing ideas and memories to paper rather than to the inside of your head, transmitting knowledge and information, uh, uh, information with the written word was often a signifier of wealth, status, and privilege. Frequently, a majority of Alabamians wanted just enough literacy to function in the economic world. Nevertheless, newspapers grew apace. The heyday of newspapers began in the turmoil of 18th century Great Britain and spread like wildfire to the colonies. 
This was transmitted to the frontier like Alabama, where by 1860, most every county had its own newspaper, some more than one. Most of these were not what we think of today as newspapers. We think of newspapers as more or less objective, not neutral, but objective in the way that historians aspire to be. Looking from the outside in, observing what occurred as an object of study and reporting accurately. Rather, these newspapers were highly partisan political rags designed on one hand to detail the minutia of daily life in the locality for local readers and on the other to yell at whomever the editor wanted to hate on. Some became important in the development of the party system during the antebellum era, and others became important in the onset of the Civil War, driving it politically. Newspapers rarely stayed afloat from subscriptions or advertisements. The ones who survived did so by getting legal advertisements from the courts, including the probate court, and from job printing. That legal advertisement business is important to our work as historians because Alabama law has long required probate judges to retain copies of all newspapers that carried legal advertisements. Even though many of those newspapers burned up in courthouse fires or dissolved in the muck of unfinished uh, courthouse basements where they were stored, we have thousands of pages of newspapers for almost 200 years of history on microfilm in the state archives. You can find many of these digitized on newspapers.com, ancestry.com, and on the Library of Congress site, Chronicling America. Book publishing was not well developed in Alabama. Practical manuals and religious tracts were the kinds of job printing that kept newspaper presses going. When the wealthy wanted novels or other bell letters, they often imported them. But that doesn't mean that Alabama did not develop authors and poets. The state did, and your textbook covers them. But like so many authors on the frontier, many Alabama authors were not particularly successful or recognized in their own time. There just wasn't much of a market for their work until later in the 19th and into the 20th century. The last cultural institution we'll cover is religion. Churches, which are not necessarily synonymous with religion, but are an institution associated with it, are important communities for sparse populations. Often, churches are the central organizing institution of a locality, even more present than the state. Let me give you an example from the mid-1700s in North Carolina that will illustrate this point. The Regulator Movement of 1755, which was a rebellion along the North Carolina frontier, consisted primarily of Scots-Irish groups who had migrated from the backcountry of Pennsylvania as Presbyterian church congregations. Then when they settled out in the frontier, they settled in villages that were the same congregations. One of the regulator's demands was that the state recognize their preachers, just as it recognized the Anglican priests along the coast as official state functionaries for the purposes of keeping land records, keeping birth records, and performing officially recognized weddings. Not everyone in antebellum Alabama was a member of a church, however. Preachers railed against this, and the ongoing revivalism of the Second Great Awakening and then later in the antebellum period was aimed to convert the so-called unchurched. One cultural critic, Frederick Law Olmsted, who was a New Englander and was the architect who designed New York Central Park, and whose sons provided a design to Troy University for its current campus, traveled through the South in the 1850s and wrote extensively about Alabama. He decried what he called the laziness of yeomen who, he claimed, did nothing but sit on their porches and dream of acquiring slaves, but who were, in reality, not farmers who needed to tend their fields all the time, but pig herders who let their herds run free, then rounded them up and sold them all at once. And Olmsted howled about the general lack of churching among um, the frontier 
of the Deep South. Nevertheless, in more populated areas, churches existed. You see here a list of religions and denominations that were represented in Antebellum, Alabama. The Baptists were the big gainers from the Second Great Awakening in the South between 1800 and 1835, and they, in their many forms, became the largest denomination in Alabama by 1860. Now, whereas today, when we think of Baptists, Southern Baptists come to mind immediately, Baptists then and, and now were highly fragmented into sub-denominations uh, such as Primitive Baptists, Free Will Baptists, Missionary Baptists, and Regular Baptists, and the barriers between them were fairly permeable. Hard to tell where one stopped and the other began. The evangelical fervor, the democratic structure, and the congregational independence of Baptists appealed to yeomen and planters alike, though more so to the poorer folk. Because so many whites were Baptists, the denomination was prominent among the enslaved, which expanded the number of adherents that Baptists claim. Methodists, who had expanded more rapidly than others in the first Great Awakening of the 1720s, was the religion of many immigrants into Alabama in the 1800s. It was the second largest denomination in the state in the antebellum period. Methodism, which had sprung from Anglicanism, has an episcopate, that is, a set of bishops, and is organized less democratically than Baptists. Its mo most identifying characteristic in the antebellum era was the circuit-riding preacher. In 1844, the Methodist Church in the U.S. split over the issue of slavery, and the following year, 1845, the Baptist Church did as well. This yielded Southern Methodists and Southern Baptists as distinct entities. Presbyterianism was the dominant religion of Scots-Irish backwood settlers in Virginia and the Carolinas, but by the time it made it to Alabama, it was prominent among the wealthy. Presbyterianism didn't grow quickly, mostly because it required its clergy to be highly educated as much as six years of divinity school, which prevented the immediate call to the ministry that propelled so many Baptist preachers. And Presbyterianism frowned on evangelical fervor. Another denomination, Episcopalianism, was the U.S. offshoot of the Church of England, the Anglicans, which was the state church during the colonial era in the southern colonies. Like Methodists, it was hierarchical, and like Catholicism, it was liturgical. It was present but not highly popular in the towns of the rivers of West Alabama, and its most salient cultural feature was its Gothic Revival architecture. The background image of this slide is St. Anthony, I'm sorry, it's St. Andrew's Episcopal Church of Prairieville in Hale County, Alabama. This church was built in 1853 by enslaved labor, and it's a great example of what's called Carpenter Gothic that followed the plans published by British American uh, uh, and, and Anglican architect Richard Upjohn. For their part, Roman Catholics came to Alabama early with the French and the Spanish in the 1700s. They migrated upriver from Mobile, but were hard pressed to make inroads after the arrival of the British, then the Americans, so most of whom were Protestants of one form or another. Catholics had an outsized presence in Mobile, still do. The seat of the bishopric of Alabama is there, as is the cathedral. And the Jesuit order there founded Spring Hill College in 1830, which is still in existence today. And by the way, it was the first white college to integrate, doing so in 1954. Jews immigrated into Alabama via Mobile, just as they did in other southern ports, most noticeably Savannah. Long medieval and Renaissance European traditions had relegated Jews to merchant occupations that had closed off other occupations to the Jews. And so many Jews had become and then became in Alabama either small shopkeepers or large wholesale merchants. Though they were small in number, 
Some of the Jewish merchant families were vitally important to the cotton kingdom where moving product and doing finance were highly important. The Philip Phillips family of Mobile was prominent. And if you remember the financial crash of 2008, you might remember the name Lehman Brothers, the finance company that fell. Lehman Brothers began as cotton merchants in antebellum Montgomery. This then ends the lecture. And as always, thanks for your attention.